Hi, and thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. My name is Swaha Patnaik. I'm the Global Economics Editor of Reuters Breaking Views. Joining me today, I have Jean-Pierre Moustier from Unicredit, George Walker of Neuburger Merberman, Martin Coiteau, Caisse de dépôt du Pla et Placement du Québec, and Jeffrey Okamoto, First Deputy Managing Director of the IMF from all around the world. Thank you very much for joining us. And um, I think your extensive and detailed bios could probably fill up most of this hour. So what I will do is leave the audience to read the bios on the side and dive into the question of the day, which, as our introductory uh, hostess just said, is on everybody's minds, from policymakers to the man on the street and woman on the street. How do we restart the economy? A lot, of course, depends on how quickly vaccines are available. And we got some potentially good news on that front from one of the world's biggest pharma giants today. Um, but we'll stay on topic and focus on the economics. What I'd like to do is start off by asking each of you um, what sort of economy exactly we're going to get restarted once we emerge from lockdown. Some of the changes COVID's brought about are not going to go away even after we start coping better with the pandemic. Perhaps Jean-Pierre Moustier, may I I'll start with you and ask you what will be the difference between the pre-COVID and post-COVID economy that we're trying to restart? Well, good afternoon or good morning, and thank you very much for inviting me. I think that uh, the big difference will be the fact that our clients or whatever industry have changed and are you know, willing uh, by necessity, by choice, to have more remote interaction with their providers. So this change of client behavior from the individuals to the companies means that our economy will have to be structured very, very differently. When you look at the retail side, when you look at the banking side, or also larger uh, companies, the fact that we have a remote interaction, different services, more use of data you know, to follow the clients, you know, will be a big discontinuity with what we have seen. But that's taking the obvious to a certain extent. The second thing which will be important, the fact that for many sectors, Companies are now extremely indebted because of the crisis and we'll have to make sure that they can rebuild their solvability. And so we will have to go through a period of adjustment thanks to more fiscal policies and, uh, you know, specifically in Europe where we have got uh, the dogma uh, uh, of, uh, you know, the, the fiscal support of the economy being broken. You know, we will have uh, much more fiscal support uh, which uh, could impact uh, different sectors. So I think new client behavior, fiscal policies that, you know, supporting the economy would be the two key themes for 2021. Thank you. Jeffrey, could I talk, turn it over to you perhaps next? Well, thanks for having me here this morning. And that was actually a good point to leave off, which is there's still quite a bit that probably needs to be done to help companies and uh, uh, you know, businesses and individuals still cope with the uh, the pandemic's course that we're likely to experience, given that a vaccine uh, being generally available is still still some time off. The question really is uh, how to target that over time and uh, and how to sort through uh, who, who should receive that kind of support. This is going to be a, a, a difficult question of supporting uh, firms that are likely to be viable on the other side of the pandemic. And that requires having some foresight into where you want the, the future economy to be. And, and I, I, I kind of agree with others here that one, we want it to be a more uh, inclusive and resilient economy. There's uh, a lot of, of uh, that we're trying to do to help countries as they're uh, increasing their, their fiscal spend in this, uh, in this environment. You put that in a way that puts it, that puts it into, you know, green investment, digital infrastructure, ways to, to transition their, their uh, labor force to the jobs of the future. Uh, and then alongside that, uh, we're also trying to make sure that there's the right space and macroeconomic uh, environment that, that economies can grow. One thing that we're encouraging countries to do now, uh, especially as they continue to spend heavily, is for those that are running up against uh, the limits of where their borrowing is to tackle their debt challenges head on now so that they have a, a, a good base to, to begin their recovery from uh, uh, over the next couple of years. Thank you. Um, perhaps I could throw it across to you, George. Yeah, I agree with what others have said. You know, I, I think a lot of also what has happened has been a meaningful acceleration of, uh, of trends that were already taking place. So the transformation of retail, the remote, remote office, 
um, telemedicine, the, the value of uh, automated factories and, and warehouses. Um, if you look at, for example, digital shopping, uh, the pandemic has has moved us forward uh, five years time, which is which is quite remarkable. Today in the U.S., um, we have twice as many folks working from home um, as we have working from work, and um, as things uh, return to the new normal, uh, that 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 leap forward um, will have resulted in fundamental change. Um, a lot of which, frankly, is is going to be powered by uh, by improvements in technology and communication, for particularly five uh, G, um, the Internet of Things, uh, the, the the cloud, um, and the like. And I think folks are continuing to to rethink um, supply chains, uh, which were already um, uh, under some pressure, um, but certainly uh, greater pressure has has been revealed. But you know, I. As we move forward into the, the, the new, new economy, I, I do think that the three, three important forces are going to continue to be um, conscientious consumers who are holding companies and, and governments accountable through, uh, through their consumption behavior, through elections, through, through engagement and activism, um, perhaps a new regulatory re- re- regime, uh, and, and finally the role of, uh, of investors, um, which we see uh, uh, continuing to change and evolve, particularly around issues of, uh, of ESG um, and the like. Thank you. Martin, over to you. Well, thank you very much for uh, for having me in this uh, conversation today. Uh, I agree very much, uh, which uh, has already been said, and particularly what George just said about the continuation of some trends that existed before this crisis, and the acceleration in some of those trends. Uh, another thing that, that will be substantially uh, accelerated also is the indebtedness of our companies, of our governments, of our individuals, of our countries in particular. And that will uh, stay with us for a number of years. And that makes it even more important to do the right investment uh, for the future. So we knew before this crisis what the investments had to be made uh, the energy transition, addressing climate change. In some countries, we have deficit in infrastructure, the quality of our infrastructure, the quantity of infrastructure in some cases. Uh, in some other countries, there are some important investments to be made in education. Uh, and, and why am I insisting on those things? It's because every time we have a crisis like this one, uh, it, it, it leaves some marks uh, for some time. So it's it's, it's a good thing that uh, we're going to have perhaps a vaccine perhaps sooner than we would have thought a few months ago. We had and we have very good uh, news about this uh, this morning. But but yet uh, we are some quarters uh, away from from being able to have a vaccine available for a large number of people. Uh, it's good news. But the time that a crisis like this one lasts uh, imply that, uh, that there, are, there are going to be some permanent or persistent uh, damages that will be done. Uh, and, and this is the reason why it's going to be important to invest further, even if we are in, in, indebted and we have to make the right choices. So if governments are to spend more in the coming years, if, if they have to incur higher deficits, if they have to carry higher debt loads, it's very important to invest in the crucial areas. And I think it's the next step that will have to be considered. Great. Thank you. Let me throw it open and now and ask you, following on from Martin's point about the economic scarring, it took a long time after the global financial crisis for economies to recover. Who uh, do you think is doing the best job, perhaps not the best job, but one of the better jobs of mitigating this economic damage and following policies which will ensure a quicker recovery? Jeffrey, maybe I could throw it over to you to start off with. I won't... Uh... Uh, identify one particular country, but I think one trend that we're seeing is that uh, advanced economies have had the, the the ability financially to deploy a lot more support, uh, both into uh, into into fiscal policy, right, so helping uh, individuals and firms, but also uh, in, into financial markets, and that has limited uh, that has kept people connected to their jobs. Uh, it has helped helped people to uh, it has kept supply chains. Uh, uh, going as people continue to spend and, uh, and, you know, businesses can, can remain open and, and, and conduct, uh, 
conduct transactions. But we're seeing the a complete opposite uh, in in, uh, in in lower income countries. They don't have the resources to be able to deploy in that respect, and so you have people, uh, you know, already in informal labor relationships that are, are seeing those disrupted. Uh, they're not able to to uh, to consume. Uh, the the supply chains are are, are breaking down, uh, and and there's not, um, you know, they don't they don't have the ability to to try and limit that scoring. And you know, arguably, right, they were the ones that needed the the, the most promise of future growth to be able to lift. Uh, people out of poverty. The World Bank has a report uh, that many millions are seeing their their uh, uh, they're, are seeing their livelihood slide backslide. Uh, you know, ten years of development gains are being foregone because uh, and will be harder to get back over time because uh, of this kind of scarring that's that's uh, that's occurring in the economy. So that's why I mean, well, again, one important point here is you know, for the for those that have the fiscal space you know, to continue to deploy resources in, in a targeted manner so that you can limit this kind of uh, this kind of impact. Thank you. I don't know if one of um, somebody else would like to jump in. Whether you've seen really good examples in your region, or perhaps uh, Jean Pierre, you you are across a wide range of regions. Uh, do you see a country that's dealing with this well or better? We have a presence at Unicredit, which uh, spans uh, between uh, European countries. And uh, just um, you know, when we saw the beginning of the health crisis, I mean, Germany managed very very well the initial issues by having a proper decentralized uh, approach using private doctors in order to uh, channel and direct the patient toward the hospital or at home for different type of uh, you know healthcare services. While France, for instance, had a very much concentrated and centralized approach, which overcrowded the hospitals, and clearly, in the first stage, the German approach was more efficient because of that. Not to comment uh, at all about the quality of the healthcare service, but I think the way the process was organized allowed Germany not to overcrowd their, their health system, while France was concentrating that for the public system only. We have seen an, an ex interesting example as well. Uh, about the machine tool manufacturing company, which um, you know was active in uh, uh, Germany, Italy, and France, and uh, basically in France they had to stop 100% uh, of their activity because of the government measures. 50% in Italy, and they are with 100% effective in Germany. So I think to your question, I think in the initial phase of the crisis. Germany handled very well, both from a health point of view as well as an economic point of view, you know, the impact of the crisis. Countries caught up, and uh, clearly you can see that every country in Europe is very focused on the health and safety of their citizens. But I think the first approach was creating a difference uh, between uh, the different economies. But now everybody is learning, and uh, I think the second lockdown that we are seeing is based on very equivalent approach between the countries, and we'll have a much lower economic impact than the first one. So we walk, you know, we, we learn by uh, experience, and uh, I'm sure that, you know, with, uh, you know, the uh, you know, uh, vaccine coming up soon, I mean, the countries will be able to exit positively, you know, this crisis and learn lessons about their health system, learn lessons about their economic approach as well. Thank you. Let me turn it over to um, those who are uh, closer to North America, perhaps, and see whether there is a difference in the social support security net that is uh, being drawn under workers in Europe and what perhaps has been offered in America. While there has been some stimulus in the US, we're still waiting to see whether there'll be a second round. And the there's not the sort of short work system that there is in Germany or France or the sort of furlough scheme that was introduced um, in the UK. Do you think the economic scarring as the US emerges will be deeper as a result? Or do you think it's just a different, more flexible um, mark job market? George, would you like to? Sure. I'll, I'll add in. I'll, I'll I'd comment you know, on the, the last question would, would also address sort of the elephant in the room, which is the, the country that if you were to just look at the numbers, um, that clearly has has managed this best, of course, would be would be China. Um, you know, their economy is 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 booming again. Manufacturing PMI we saw in September up at uh, 51. Uh, uh, you know, we see traffic congestion uh, uh, well ahead of where it was year on year. Steel demand up, so on and so forth. Now, you know, obviously they pursued um, 
measures that would be unlikely to work in other countries. So, you know, comprehensive cell phone tracking of the population, uh, more aggressive lockdowns than would be uh, would be possible. Um, uh, mass testing in in, in re- uh, response to even even quite small outbreaks. But uh, you know, I think they. Uh, we should look at the numbers and acknowledge them, and uh, their their response um, has been uh, has been effective. And I absolutely, you know, that I, I agree um, with the earlier comment about uh, some of the challenges in, in emerging markets not having the ability uh, to to have the uh, the stimulus efforts. If you look at India, for example, um, has uh, has been been challenged. Um, in terms of, uh, in answer to the, the uh, your, your other question with regards to uh, stimulus measures in the states, I think we will see in the the states um, um, another round of, of stimulus. Um, I think it'll be smaller than uh, than uh, might have happened had the, the Democrats uh, won in the Senate, but it'll still be substantial. Um, call it one point point five uh, trillion or so. Um, the U.S., though, I, you know, I, I think, frankly, the U.S. is bungled. Um, is probably the technical term. The uh, the, the coronavirus uh, response. That having been said, uh, the the nature of the U.S. economy um, is going to allow it to uh, perform okay. So the the you know, vis a vis European countries, frankly, that have handled it better. Um, so the the size of the U.S. Uh, technology. Uh, uh, companies, communication services, um, smaller reliance on things like financials and energy, I think, uh, means despite the U.S.'s bungling of, uh, of the coronavirus, that the economy uh, will, be, uh, will be surprisingly resilient. And so it'll still take some time. We're still going to see, you know, a negative GDP print this year. But by, uh, by the end of next year, um, and, and perhaps earlier, we'll be back. Um, back to uh, back to where we work. Thank you, and Martin. My comment, my question was actually prompted by your uh, comments on scarring. So let me ask you: your Do question? you see a transatlantic divide? Yeah, sure. Your question is very important because one of the characteristic of, of this crisis um, and the way it's been uh, unfolding so far has been the asymmetry. Uh, between country in terms of having been affected, of course, but also government response and societal's response has been quite different from country to country, region to region. Uh, we've been talking just a few uh, seconds ago about China. China and a handful of Asian countries uh, have put a strong emphasis on uh, strict lockdowns, uh, widespread testing, uh, tracing contacts uh, to an extent that we haven't seen either in the United States, uh, Canada, or or in Western Europe, uh, for, for for that matter. Uh, another key difference, and and you you mentioned that in your question, um, has been uh, the way that governments have supported uh, their economy through this crisis and the differences between North America and and Europe. Europe has been uh, supporting more. Uh, the capacity of businesses and companies to maintain the employment link uh, in Canada and the U.S. Most support has, has been going to household. And as a matter of fact, uh, in, in, in an amazing way, um, uh, disposable income, household disposable income has increased despite uh, record high unemployment in both Canada and the U.S. Uh, and that explains a lot why uh, it's not the only ingredient, of course, but it explains a lot why uh, the recovery has been that fast, quick and, and, and impressive in the U.S. and Canada so far. Still, uh, if we cannot control this pandemic, uh, there are limits to any of those approaches. The approach to support household income in North America is unsustainable in the long term if you cannot have a, uh, a normal economy, a growing economy. So the, the real good news will come when we are able to control this pandemic. They've been controlling in a different way in China uh, and in a handful of Asian countries. In our countries, we have to wait for a, a vaccine, perhaps later this year. The good news that we had this morning are extremely encouraging or better medical treatments because we've chosen a different approach. But the fact is, uh, supporting the economy through stimulus measure is just a way to bridge the situation from now to a better future, 
but it's only a bridge. It cannot uh, it cannot uh, be a substitute for for managing this pandemic and restoring the engine of growth. Thank you. I think all of you have mentioned um, in turn uh, at various points the role that fiscal policy is playing. We have, um, I think, the big difference between the global financial crisis and this one is that fiscal policy has actually stepped up, particularly in Europe, rather than leaving monetary policy to do all the hard work. Jean-Pierre, can I start by asking you perhaps, there are countries, with, including in Italy, uh, with very high elevated debt levels relative to GDP, once all this is over, do you think we'll just live with it or will we have to look at somebody paying for all of the bridging sort of costs, uh, as Martin said, for getting us through this pandemic? Well, you're absolutely right to say that uh, there are some countries which have uh, already a very high debt to GDP level. I think beyond the ratio itself, it's important to look at the debt sustainability and the cost of servicing the debt. And, um, you know, you can see in uh, different countries in Europe that uh, today they can refinance at levels which are much lower, basically, than their uh, average cost of debt. So I think the debt service, you know, is going to be still affordable for many countries. And we have to remember that uh, a debt to GDP ratio is a ratio. And so it will be important as well to look at uh, what are the measures which, uh, you know, can boost GDP and how we can come back to trend GDP, basically close the gap with the pre-GDP uh, level, pre-COVID GDP level. And, uh, you know, in Europe, we have uh, the different actions which have been put in place by the Commission for the next generation EU uh, a package, which uh, should help GDP meaningfully in many countries, starting, for instance, in Italy, where I am today, and uh, in others on the CE side as well. So I uh, remain extremely optimistic that, you know, there shouldn't be any specific tension as far as the sovereign debt is concerned. And in addition to that, uh, the ECB, with its uh, very decisive policies and its quantitative easing, is making sure that, you know, there shouldn't be any widening of the spread either for the different sovereign what the GDP can recover. So not an easy situation, but a situation which can be very well managed as far as Europe is concerned. Thank you. Let me jump, jump across the other side of the Atlantic. And George, ask you, do you think we're going to pay for this at some point, or are we just going to live with higher debt to GDP levels and central banks just carrying on buying? Democracies don't have a, have a terrific track record at, uh, at, at uh, um, addressing long-term, long-term challenges uh, like this. And I think the, you know, the real, the real risk, of course, is, uh, is secular you know stagnation as we've seen uh, as we've seen in Japan and other places and you know are we going to enter a period of, of disinflation and, and below trend growth um, despite uh, the uh, unprecedented uh, monetary and, uh, and and fiscal policy so I don't uh, I, 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 I suspect that's you know that will be the longer term challenge is will this will these high uh, debt levels constrain uh, growth uh, in, uh, in, in, in future years. Thank you. Martin, may I turn to you and ask you perhaps a slightly provocative question? We've been waiting for inflation to turn up for so many years, we may have forgotten what it looks like. But, I mean, the issue is that the um, stimulus this time has not just been conducted by monetary authorities, but stimulus directly injected into the economy through fiscal policy. And that's the difference. Um, what may be worse than sort of no inflation and very little growth may be a lot of inflation and not much growth, because then the central bank mandates start coming into conflict with what fiscal policy makers would like, which is basically to keep borrowing costs low. Do you see any risk at all of that? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, you see those debt levels that we have, those debt to GDP ratio that we, we see now and that we're going to have to live with for many years uh, are compatible with growth as long as we can keep interest rates very low. Uh, not necessarily stellar growth, but at least a continuation of growth process. The problem will be if ever uh, inflation shows up because the capacity of central banks to maintain such a low rate environment, the one that we've had for the last decade actually, uh, is uh, is pretty much dependent on how inflation will behave in the future. Um, it's, it's hard to predict exactly what's going to happen. Um, 
I don't think that central banks can really generate inflation unless they are actually inflating away uh, the debt by direct monetary financing. You might say that they have been doing this over the last months, but it's not exactly the same thing as doing that on a permanent basis. And financing through monetary means uh, current expenditures. I don't think they will get into that. In our countries, I would be extremely surprised that they would get into that on a on a large scale basis. So. We, we might end up in a, uh, in a relatively low inflation for some time. And, and, and what, would this, uh, what this would guarantee is the persistence of those low rates. Now, this being said, uh, there are trends going on also in the world economy that might, pro uh, uh, that might produce the opposite. Uh, globalization, for instance, uh, we all know, uh, is not progressing, has not been progressive, uh, progressing since the, uh, the great financial crisis. Actually, the, the share of trade to world GDP is on the decline. Uh, so some of the forces that kept prices uh, under very strict competitive pressures over the last uh, three decades, I would say, are uh, slightly uh, less present. They could be even less present in the future. So. There is a potential for increases in costs that could push inflation higher for some time. And the key question is how uh, central banks would, would address that. I would, I would guess that uh, they would tolerate more inflation if it happens to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to appear in the system. But it, there's no guarantee that it will happen. If, if economies remain slow, if governments cannot uh, go on uh, large-scale uh, debt increases in the future, either because uh, they, they feel that there are sustainability, sustainability issues or for uh, political reasons that would constrain their capacity to act, we might end up in, a, in an environment of low inflation, low interest rates and low growth. It could really happen. Jeffrey, um, can I turn to you? You have a holistic global view. Perhaps, I mean, do you see any risk at all of what we're saying, not just in developed countries, but in developing countries where the inflationary pressures may have different sort of uh, contours of uh, any sort of clash between central banks who are supposed to be keeping interest rates and inflation sort of in, firmly in their eyes and governments who have very different priorities. This is a key issue that we're helping uh, uh, lower countries sort through, which is they're trying to, they don't have, they're, they're resource constrained and they see advanced economy central banks uh, using unconventional monetary policy to provide critical support. And so we're seeing some experimentation on that with middle income countries at the moment. We just released uh, a report that uh, that uh, details some of that. You can you can look at that on our website. Uh, but in in low income countries in particular, I mean, the depth of capital markets is, is an issue. The capacity to execute uh, some of these types of policies is um, uh, it just isn't there. And so that that just that, that constrains them in. But but just on the uh, just to get back to this issue of of inflation, I mean, I think inflation as the as the way to pay for some of this spending. I mean, I think you you put the question right: who is supposed to pay the bill for the extraordinary amount of support that's been deployed? Inflation isn't in itself, uh, and central bank support is not a free choice. So that has its own kind of uh, uh, consequences, particularly in my view, distributional consequences uh, that uh, that may be untoward. And so we have to carefully consider. Uh, you know, the balance of, um, of measures that are taken. One thing that we're actively encouraging countries uh, to consider now is to make try to make progress, particularly in, in those countries that have had it on the books for a while uh, but haven't quite got around to it, uh, you know, improve their, their tax policies so that they collect the requisite revenue in a, in a way that is, is, is growth conducive. Um, the problem with that is the need for those kinds of changes is higher now than ever. Uh, but the capacity and the political capacity in particular to deliver on that uh, is, is somewhat hampered because of, uh, of the current environment. Thank you. And I mean, Jean-Pierre, let me turn back to you. So as a representative of the banking sector, we rely on banks to be the transmission mechanism for monetary policy. However, uh, low for a very, very long time interest rates and a very flat yield curve in many developed countries makes life very hard for banks, despite their balance sheet being stronger than before the global financial crisis. How, how do you see the banking sector coping with, um, as several of the panelists have said, a very low for a long time interest rate environment? Well, first of all, it's important to um, recognize that uh, the negative interest rate 
I know I've been favorable for the economy and I've helped the economy uh, go through this shock. So bankers are always uh, very quick to complain. It's fair to say that negative interest rate had the negative impact on the top line of banks, but have had a positive impact on, on their loan loss provision. So net net, you know, banks benefited from that. So the question is, would a negative rates or very flat yield curve last for much longer? Uh, so we might go actually for the reversal rate, and it was interesting to see some of the ECB board members starting to speak last week about the reversal rate, meaning a rate uh, beyond which uh, the behavior of economic agent can be exactly the opposite of what the central bank is expecting. So um, I think that uh, it will be important uh, to see what should be the next move of the central banks. Knowing that uh, fundamentally, you know, as long as the rates are positive, banks can manage, uh, uh, you know, their activity. But when they become negative, uh, you have in the bank balance sheet a fundamental asymmetry. But the deposit for most of their clients are floored at zero. It's uh, illegal in many countries to pass negative rates uh, to the client. While on the lending side, uh, you can have uh, uh, rates uh, which are negative as a reference, and you absorb uh, part of the credit spread. And so I think what will be important to see in the future is, you know, how do we deal with the asymmetry in the bank balance sheet? Would the central bank do more than what they've been doing so far? For instance, in Europe, for the tiering or the TLTRO, in order to one side provide, uh, you know, cheap liquidity to banks, but allow banks to offset uh, the negative impact of negative interest rate and this asymmetry in the balance sheet. So short term, it has been positive. Medium term, you know, the answer remains to be seen. But I think the ECB on one side is uh, starting to recognize that some actions will need to be taken, which is good news. Thank you. George, I mean, let me ask you on the financial market, some of the things Jean-Pierre is talking about, about some uh, members of the ECB who have concerns. I mean, notably the German central banker, Jens Weidemann, you would expect this from a German, but he was this last week pointing out um, the risk, even before we're out of this crisis, of what might happen in the next one, which is asset price bubbles, fiscal dominance. Do you see any of these concerns when you look at asset prices and look ahead to sort of the next war we should be fighting, if you like, before we, we, we are even out of this one? It's always, uh, you know, it's always good to look ahead. And, and obviously, there are uh, a, a wide range of, of potential outcomes, particularly is uh, particularly is as uh, um, time as um, time increases. Um, you know, nothing, I think it's fair to say nothing around the world is terribly cheap right now, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, what's been now over a decade, 12 years of, of free money, um, has caused, uh, uh, asset prices, um, broadly, uh, to, to be expensive. Um, that having been said there, you know, if you were to look at equity markets as a, as a barometer or other markets as a barometer, you know, I, I think things are expensive, but not 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 crazy, not in not in not in nosebleed territory. Particularly, um, if one believes, as uh, as our comments have all suggested, and as uh, as the yield curve suggests, um, that rates are going to remain low uh, for uh, for for a long period of time. So, I, I think it's you know it's reasonable to be concerned, and we should always be be vigilant. But when you see uh, um, Asset price. You see equities that are valued today at you know 22 times forward uh, uh, earnings in a relatively tech-centric economy. It's not not crazy. Um, uh, emerging markets, you know, down sort of in the in the high teens, 18 or so. Certainly above both above historical averages by call it five turns or so. Um, but I think that's largely explained uh, largely explained by uh, by rates. So. Uh, wise, wise to be vigilant, um, and and nothing is cheap. But uh, um, I, I think some concerns that, that folks have are are overstated, um, given the the underpinnings of real concurrent uh, earnings levels. 
Thank you. Martin, could I ask you, I mean, the uh, number of trillions of negative yielding debt in the world is just going up and up. I think, uh, you know, George has just touched on some of the equity valuations. However, it's very hard to get a return. Do you see any sort of risks of bubbles either in high yield where central banks like the Fed have started buying for the very first time or anywhere else in the market landscape? Well, I, I, I wouldn't point to a, a, a subsection of the markets in particular, but there are always risk of bubbles down the road when we are living in a world of this of these low interest rates. Uh, nominal rates in some cases are negative in some cases, but they are almost everywhere uh, negative in real terms. So that encourages excessive risk taking, taking, of course, in some areas of the markets. This being said, uh, there are uh, sectors and companies that are doing really well. Uh, they were doing well before this crisis. They've been uh, doing very well during this crisis because they had the right business model. They were using technology in a way that uh, make them uh, more resilient. And at this stage, quite frankly, if we uh, if we can really cope uh, in the end with this pandemic, if we can uh, with medical advances, with the uh, arrival eventually of the vaccine, some of the sectors that have suffered uh, will will recover also. So there are good news that that can still be coming. But I agree very much that markets are not cheap at all <laughs> in general. Uh, in some segments of the markets, uh, they are really expensive. And it's got a lot to do with uh, those low levels of interest rates. So if there is a risk in the future, and I'm back to where I was uh, before, it's the risk that those rates at one stage uh, wouldn't stay that low. And, 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 and the real risk for me that could trigger that is, is higher inflation. If we have higher inflation in the future, the whole uh, building of uh, that underpin uh, those low interest rates will, will be under uh, under stress. Uh, and again, I'm not saying that this will happen. There are several forces, many forces in the economy uh, that are still propelling those low rates, low rates of inflation. Uh, but who knows uh, what kind of environment we'll be in in a couple of years and five years and 10 years from now. Nobody really knows. And we have to be very careful, take those risks on board, monitor them and be prepared in uh, in case we need to uh, to 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 uh, to think differently and manage our investments differently. Thank you, and um, Jeffrey, you have the whole of the brains trust of the IMF, which looks across everything. Your fiscal monitor is absolutely um, sort of in depth. You have the financial stability report. Does the IMF see, as you were pointing out earlier, you were saying countries should keep an eye on debt sustainability, even as we uh, approach this, if they have potential issues? Is there something that the IMF is seeing that it feels people should be keeping an eye on, even as we deal with the pandemic? Yeah, thanks. The the, uh, the brain trust is is a uh, uh, work, works behind me, but uh, the, this this material is all out as you as you rightly point out to uh, for people to read on 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 debt in particular. I mean, when we saw eighty five percent of the global economy experience some sort of lockdown uh, this year and and extraordinary support to spend to kind of uh, as as as, uh, as the panel kind of put it, bridge us to somewhere, and we we, we hope that that's a a future that is is coming along soon. But that that wasn't that wasn't free, and so there's balance sheet deterioration almost uh, up and down the entire uh, chain. So governments, subnational governments, uh, firms, and households, uh, with the exception maybe of some balance sheet repair that occurred in the U.S. because of the extraordinary support uh, to individuals. Uh, th th these are going to be issues that are going to be with us for some time, and for governments. You know, we're again we're, we're encouraging them to to you know, uh, keep an eye on this. Uh, if rates remain low, you know the ability to keep uh, servicing that debt um, remains in place. Uh, but uh, but but no no one knows how long that that will be in place for. And so it's it's we need we need countries to chart a path uh, to medium term fiscal sustainability. That's something that we are enforcing uh, in the resumption of our of our bilateral surveillance missions uh, with countries. And then there's also this critical issue of what do you do about uh, uh, indebted firms, right? So there's going to be a, 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 you know, plenty of, 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 uh, of firms that may just not be able to make it uh, to, the, to the other side of this, either because the business model, the demand for that uh, has fundamentally shifted uh, as a result of the pandemic, or uh, you know, the firm was just too weak to begin with, and the, the additional debt load is just something that they can't, they can't cope with, and they won't be able to earn their way out of this 
uh, going forward. And, and to that end, uh, you know, the insolvency regimes and being able to uh, you know, work this through the system is, is critical, not just for the firm, but also for the financial sector uh, and, for, and for growth going forward. Thank you, Jeffrey. Jean-Pierre, may I turn that over to you? I mean, non-performing loans are sort of anathema for banks um, like yours. What, what do you make of the point that Jeffrey is talking about for um, the indebtedness that bank, you know, corporates face? I think that uh, you know, banks have taken you know, decisive actions and dramatic actions actually to reduce uh, non-performing exposure. At Unicredit since 2015, we have reduced our NPE non-performing exposure portfolio by more than 55 billion, which is uh, 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 massive, basically, for disposal write-off uh, or, or recoveries. And uh, the regulator is uh, very fixated to make sure that uh, banks can proactively manage their portfolio you know, through what we call Canada provisioning, which is a way to put uh, regulatory capital uh, requirements, make sure that uh, the non-performing exposure are provisioned, quote-unquote, at 100% after a few years. So I think that, um, you know, with uh, what we have seen in the past few years, you know, banks' willingness to proactively approach the NPE, a new market developing in terms of uh, ability to purchase uh, this uh, non-performing exposure, the banks can proactively manage their balance sheet, keep financing the economy, and making sure that for loans which can be doubtful and define investors. So I don't see that uh, you know we should have, uh, from the outcome of COVID, any negative impact coming from non-performing exposure on banks' ability to support the economy. Furthermore, because banks have a much higher capital ratio on one side, which allow them to finance the economy, on the other side, which allow them to take the proper provisioning uh, to take care of these non-performing exposures. So that's great. Thank you. Um, we are sort of coming towards the end of the time of our session. We've got a few minutes left still, but let me take some of the questions that are coming through from the audience, um, just to make sure we're addressing the, the, the issues that interest them as well. So when economies are cratering, any recovery is going to be better than none. Um, one of the questions here is that, you know, how can we make sure that the recovery is done in a sustainable way through either financial tools, regulation, incentives or something else? And do you think enough is being done to make this a green recovery as we restart the economy? Um, let me throw it open to you. George, can I ask you to go first? Um, sure. You know, I, I think... Um Obviously, governments matter, and we're going to go through a, we're going to go through a change in government uh, here here in the U.S. Uh, and I suspect that we will be uh, suspect that we will be doing uh, will be doing more uh, on on that front. I do think, though, um, that that both the, the consumers I, I really do think are, are changing and, and changing globally, and I, I think, um, frankly, investors uh, in, in private capital. Uh, is is changing and that that'll make a real difference. I, as a uh, you know, as a, a money management firm, if I look at just the RFPs that we get from global uh, financial institutions, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, um, uh, labor pools of capital, and the like, if we look back four or five years ago, seven percent of those uh, were were asking about our ESG capabilities. We're now up into the the seventies. Uh, and people are really starting to hold our feet to the fire in terms of uh, how we make investment decisions and, and frankly, from my, my judgment, how we engage thereafter and are we doing enough uh, to help companies uh, become more sustainable. And I think that trend uh, is a powerful and important one and that, that many of us participating uh, in this conference can, uh, can, can encourage. And so while, yes, absolutely more needs to be done um, by governments and regulators, I, I do think uh, I encourage each of us here to, to continue to focus on sustainability um, uh, outside of, wouldn't just leave that to the governments and others, it's, uh, it's a, a duty for, for each of us to carry that banner forward. Thank you. Martin, can I ask you what you what you think, uh, whether enough change is happening on this front? 
It, it's always a collective work. So uh, the government has a key role in that, obviously. Uh, uh, and in fact, we need to invest in sustainable growth. We need to invest in uh, equitable growth, uh, in, in stable growth over the long, long run. And that means investing in infrastructure, investing in uh, taking uh, seriously uh, the climate change uh, emergency, uh, investing in education. So that's the, the role of the government. But the private sector, pension funds in particular, I'm working at CDPQ, a, a major investor of uh, Quebec pension funds money, uh, we have to build uh, also the future uh, in a sustainable manner. And we, we like to uh, to approach this as saying that we are bringing constructive capital uh, and bringing returns to uh, our uh, pension funds at the same time as we're investing in stable growth and equitable growth and sustainable growth. Thank you. We are nearly running out of time. I'm going to ask, I think uh, somebody mentioned an elephant in the room earlier. Let, I couldn't, I have my press card taken away if I didn't ask about the US election. I don't know if one of you would like to tackle whether you think that the US will play a very different role in the new world order or the pandemic, post-pandemic world order in the next four years. George, I think you're pretty willing to tackle this. <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh... Yeah, so the, the election in the States, while uh, it's not uh, not official yet, is, is essentially, for, for all practical purposes, over. Um, and I do, I, I do you, you've seen it being broadly embraced uh, around the world. Uh, I've enjoyed uh, looking at, at headlines in, uh, in various newspapers in, in Europe and in Asia. Uh, my favorite was one that said, Welcome Back, America, uh, which I think is, is probably accurate. And I think that the U.S., uh, will 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 play a different role, particularly uh, with regards to uh, uh, our allies and uh, our our long our long standing three year feud with Canada is uh, is perhaps over. And uh, I think uh, I think the U S will will re engage more along uh, along historical norms, and uh, this 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 four year period will uh, will be seen as an aberration which doesn't mean that the forces of populism don't exist and that there won't be new challenges, both from the left and from the right. Uh, but I'd like to think America is going to be a more constructive voice in, uh, in, in, in the world uh, in the years ahead. Thank you, George. That's great. Thank you very much. On that note, fairly positive, let me wind up by thanking all of you, Jean-Pierre, George, Jeffrey, Martin from on all sides of the Atlantic. Thank you very much for joining us and for sharing your thoughts very uh, frankly and honestly. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us and listening to this panel.